let's let's call this meeting to order. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, don't think you all know us, so why don't we just go around and say our names? Jamie Morby. Okay, I'm Ann Winchester. I'm the chair, obviously. Jordan Keyes. Ann Tulin. Gabriel Molina. All right, thank you. So we will now open a hearing um, for the purpose of, well, I'm going to read the warning first. Um, I will read that what happened is on May 22nd, 2023, Mark Whitman, who is not here, right, uh, filed a complaint stating that on the evening of th Thursday, May 18th, he was attacked by two large dogs running at large on Kent Hill Road near Kent's Corner. The owner of the two dogs is Elsa Inkman, who resides on Kent Hill Road in Gospel Hollow. Is Elsa in the room? Ah, oh, thank you for coming. Look, I, I really want to, you know, we understand this has been very, very difficult for you, and that you've been traumatized by this. And we're going to try, we're going to try very hard not to make that worse. Thank you. I also have my teenage daughter. Again, I would really appreciate it. Okay, and, and from the emails I've been getting from people, I want to say it sounds to me like, as a community, we would like to make this hearing kind and helpful and not um, cause further distress to both people. Well, Mark isn't here, but he may watch the tape. Both people have been through a lot in the last week. It's been very difficult for both of them. And I ask you all, as you speak, to be kind and thoughtful and respectful of what, how difficult this has been for both people. And I will say that the purpose of this hearing is to hear the um, complaint under the town ordinance. There are a few copies Barbara put over here if anybody wants to see them. Um, what we're going to do under this ordinance is we're going, we're going to read the purpose it is the purpose of this ordinance to regulate the keeping of dogs and to provide for their leashing, muzzling, restraint, impoundment, and destruction, and their running at large. We are not going to do all those things, I'm sure, but I just want, I'm just reading this. Um, to, um, so as to protect the health and safety of the town and the quiet enjoyment of its residents' homes and properties. Now, just for a moment to address the uh, elephant in the room, we are aware that following this attack, the dog was found dead on this one of the dogs on the side of the road, and that there have been allegations of uh, wrongful conduct in that death. We are not here to discuss that. That is, is the game warden here? Do, do you, you filed a complaint with the game warden, yes, is that right? and the game warden is investigating that, we are not going to take evidence on that issue, okay? We are only going to try to determine whether we have a dog in town and we need that who has been threatening people or scaring people and whether we should take some kind of action to, to uh, ensure as best we can that that doesn't happen again. Um, we will, as I said, we will not take evidence regarding the other issue, okay? Um, so, with that said, all right, um, I'm going to start by asking members of the select board if, uh, I, I'm going to just assume that we've all had what could be called ex parte contact, <coughs> which means that we've all had conversations with <coughs> about this. We've been trying not to talk about it because we are bound to only make our decision based on the evidence that we gather in this hearing. But this is a small town. I'm sure every one of us knows at least one person involved. And I'm sure that there may be some of us who haven't. But I'm just going to ask at this time that each member of the select board state that they believe that they can uh, hear the evidence and make a decision in an unbiased fashion. All right, so Jamie, do you believe that you can do that? Yes, I believe I can. Okay, Jordan? Yes, I do. Yes, I can. Yes, I do. And I do also. So with that said, uh, let me explain what we're going to do here. I'm going to start, um, since Mark isn't here, 
We're going to start by, Mark has submitted several documents, including a statement and some pictures. We're going to put those into evidence. I'm going to ask somebody, I'm just recovering from bronchitis, so I don't want to speak more than I have to. Um, so I'm going to ask somebody here to read these documents so that you can all hear the evidence that Mark has submitted, and you may speak to them if you wish to. Um, then we'll hear from Elsa. You can either speak, Elsa, or you can just, we'll just read your statement as whatever you're comfortable with. Thank you. And then um, we'll give people a chance to ask you questions. Right. Then we're going to allow anybody else who has evidence that can help us in the decision of whether or not we have a dog issue and whether, and perhaps could help us determine um, how we might deal with it, a chance to testify. Yes. Can I just ask a question about the statements that were sent in? Several yeah. people who wanted to be here, who you know my dogs were not able to be here and have written sent in statements. Will those be read? Yes, they will be put into evidence along with um, any testimony that anybody here wants to offer. So after we've heard from you and Mark, however we hear from you, I'm going to ask. Well, Barbara, you have the list here. Do we have a lot of people who actually want to give testimony? Only two, one person, two people have signed up who want to give testimony. Okay. I'm sorry, three. Three. All right. We'll hear from those people. I'm going to put you on the oath before you speak. Thank you. And then, if people really want to keep talking after that, we can sort of close the evidentiary portion of the hearing. And we, after that, what you say won't be evidence. It won't be anything that we'll use when we're making a decision. But if we as a community want to discuss this some more, I think we should, we will provide that opportunity. Can I ask one more clarifying question? Yes, anybody can at this point. Will ask me. Will there be a procedural. decision made tonight about? Probably not. Okay. What we'll do, we'll close the hearing, or we'll, we'll perhaps decide we need more information, in which case we can continue the hearing. We'll go into deliberative session, and then we'll issue a decision. Okay. okay. You have a question. Yeah. Um, so I just want to understand what evidence you um, consider when making your decision under the ordinance about whether this is a nuisance dog problem. And, if, and I just want to be clear that the evidence that you're going to listen to in the evidentiary part of the hearing is just about the incident, that the specific incident that Mark Whitman submitted a complaint about and not about other incidents with those animals. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, that is correct. We have no authority over that. That's being heard in a different venue. Um, uh, I don't I think, think you saying understand. It's, what it's being investigated. No. I don't think you understand what I mean. I'm oh, not. I'm sorry. Previous issues. I beg yes. your pardon. I thought yes. you meant following. Yes. So your question is, will we hear about those? Is that evidence? Is that evidence? Yes, that is evidence. Because We're I didn't sign the evidence side of the sign. You may do so. Because I didn't have evidence about the incident. You may do so. Point, but I have evidence of prior. Yeah. So, so let me be clear. That is evidence, could be evidence, that could help us to determine if, if it's a repeated um, occurrence and if we feel that we need to do something about that. Thank you. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, question. Um, yes, so um, we've spoken. I'm Maria Malekos. I, oh, I spoke with you the other day. I just wanted to face to a name. Um, one of the things that I want to be clear about is during this process, um, I had spoken to you this about. Uh, I had spoken to you about this earlier. That there um, have there been any complaints to the town about these dogs previously? Uh, there have been, as far as we've looked at the records, yes, there have been complaints, but as far as we can tell, they have never been officially investigated. Okay. And so then my question is, is it possible to be very clear about what is hearsay and what is an actual that's, interaction, that's, right? Because I think that in a small town like this, 
we could hear say all day long, and that is not actually going to be helpful in this situation. I would like it. I would like to, to try as much as we could to stick to facts, as opposed to my neighbor said. I've heard about that. I, 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 I blah blah blah. I appreciate that, and I, absolutely, I, people should report on what they observed and what happened to them, Thank you. but not talk about other, what happened, the hearsay. Yeah. I yeah, and then also I just would uh, piggyback on that step and make sure that we're following the process per the ordinance that, you know, if those were not formal complaints to the town, do they really count as, because it's very specific, first offense, second offense, third offense. So Correct. Well, as I far as I actually being, have a question about that. Yeah, because right? whatever is discussed here, oh yeah, that happened to me last year, but, you know, that's not really an official complaint to the town. And so, uh, oh, God, I forgot to, but let me, let me answer that. Okay. Um, under the ordinance, if it was an offense that happened over a year ago, it does, it no longer counts as a first offense. So anything anybody talks about that ha happened more than a year ago would not create a first offense. And as far as we can tell, looking at the records, there have been no complaints in the last year. So unless somebody can bring forward some evidence that would convince us otherwise, this will be treated as a first offense. Okay, Barbara wanted to say something. So there was an event that was brought to the town a year and a half ago specific to these two dogs. And it was, the town was involved. I have a written report on that, but it was over 12 months ago. Um, yeah. Can you please um, clarify how it works when people want to make a comment? Do they stand? Do they state their name? I want the, like, how the procedure works. So, like, that person spoke. I don't know, like, I would like that, like, very Thank you. You're right. That you. that does need to happen. Would you state your name, please? My name is Heather Scandale, and I'm asking for clarification yeah. for okay. what the procedure is when you'd like to make a comment. Okay. Certainly, when people are testifying, we will ask them to clearly state their name. Rose over here is taking notes, and she's going to need to hear it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Elsa. Just ask for this is Elsa Ingpen. One more question about dog ordinance procedure. Is it? ever procedure that an official complaint is filed and the owner is not involved because I have never been contacted by the town about any official complaint about yeah. my dogs. I understand. So we will treat this as a first offense. Thank you. All right. Other questions about procedure? Yes. I think this is a procedural question, um, although it was partially answered by the, it has to be within a year. But um, if there's not an animal control officer, the complaint is still made to the town and is official through making it to the town, clerk, the town clerk. clerk's office. Okay. All right. Um, I, Cole, yes. I will tell you that we've had an applicant for animal control officer. He has not yet been trained. But um, I did ask Barbara, after we received, received the complaint, to sort of act as our animal control officer. We obviously could not be involved in collecting information, but I asked her to just go talk to Elsa for the purpose of collecting information. At the time, I had no idea whether we were sending Barbara into a dangerous situation or not. And I therefore asked Cole to please accompany her because Cole is very experienced in working with animals. Um, Cole will give you a chance to speak if you wish later. Uh, so. Although we do not have an animal control officer, we have one that might become our animal control officer. We'll talk about that at a different meeting. Other procedural questions? Oh, that was Gabriello asked that. So. Um, other procedural questions? Okay. With that, we're going to hear from Mark as best we can um, without him here. I'll, Mark filed a complaint as you know, and I would ask, well, I can read these first couple of documents, they're short. Mark's statement in when he filed the complaint on Monday morning following the incident is, I was jogging on Robinson Cemetery Road when I encountered Elsa's two great Pyrenees dogs roaming at large. They both attacked me, the male biting my hand while the female bit the back of my leg. Medical treatment was necessary. 
The male dog has been aggressive towards me on several other occasions, chasing, barking, growling. This is the first time he has bitten me. Mark then, and I'm going to ask somebody else to read this, I can read it. submitted a more formal statement. And then we also have the report that Barbara made when she, she Barbara went, also went and interviewed Mark. And so Barbara is making a report with more information. So if you would read those two into the record, that would be great. And, and, go ahead. The first one, Mark Whitman's written statement to the Calais Select Board, May 24, 2023. To the Calais Select Board, as I'm unable to attend Thursday night's special meeting, so I wanted to submit a brief statement of what I think are some important facts to consider. One, on the day that Elsa's dog attacked me, I went straight to her house to tell her. I found her to be at home, and the first thing she said upon opening her door was, are my dogs loose? This means that her dogs had been running loose for at least an hour, yet she was unaware. Two, these dogs have a known history of running at large. They've been seen by us and our neighbors several times in the Apple Hill area. In addition to the day of my attack, I also saw them loose earlier this spring and once last summer. Three, I know there have been other times that these dogs have attacked people. I'm extremely concerned that the proven viciousness of these dogs, coupled with their owner's proven inability to control them, makes for a serious threat to Callis residents. It's worth noting that my attack occurred on part of the loose used by many people every day for walking, running, and biking. Thank you, Mark Whitman. <clears throat> Interview with Mark Whitman, Monday, May 22nd, 2023, conducted by Barbara Butler, Assistant Town Clerk, and Tegan Dykeman Brown, Town Clerk. Mark was running south down Robinson Cemetery Road on Thursday evening, May 18th. As he approached Judy Bingham's garage, he saw both dogs on the other side of the road before they spotted him. He knows them to be aggressive and opted to get on the far side of the road, not make eye contact with them and run past. He could tell when they spotted him and knew when they were rushing him from behind. Mark quickly turned around and caught the male dog by the throat, collar, and midair. This is what resulted in the bites on the top of his hand. While he was holding the dog by the throat in midair is when the female dog bit him on the back of the leg. Mark said he was stunned and didn't know what to do. He felt he could overcome one dog, but not two. He said he threw the male dog as far as he could, screamed at them as loud as he could, and ran. Mark ran down Kent Hill Road to Elsa's house. He said his hand and leg were both bloody, and when Elsa opened the door, she said, are my dogs loose? He told Elsa he was going to kill her dogs. Mark admits it was in the heat of the moment, not knowing that the dogs, knowing, excuse me, that the dogs have been aggressive over the years. He left Elsa's and continued on his run back home. He told Angus of the attack and then drove himself to the ER. I asked Mark if he knew that the male dog is now dead. He seemed stunned and said no, he had not heard that. I asked him if he could tell if either of the dogs had previously been attacked by a porcupine, and he said no. He said he's seen dogs attacked by a porcupine in the past, and it's very easy to see the quills coming out of their mouth, head, etc. He saw no evidence of porcupine quills. I told Mark that Elsa had filed an animal abuse cruelty complaint with the game warden, and that Mark can expect to hear from the game warden in the next few days. Mark will forward photos of his injured hand so we can attach them to the written complaint. I told Mark the select board will be holding a dog attack hearing possibly this Thursday evening to be determined. Mark said if he needs to be there, he will try. However, he would rather not have to confront Elsa and he would rather not be further involved in this incident unless required to be. Tegan, please reply all if you see any misrepresentations in these notes or please I don't know if you need that part. Thank you. No, you don't okay. need that. <laughs> um, all right. Um, we Mark has also submitted a an animal bite report from the town of um, from the Department of Health, in which it describes um, the incident, and it uh, the person I'm trying that, to see. That's actually. Oh, well, this the is Jay Copping. So this was our town health officer. Jay Copping investigated, and here's what he's written. 
The female uh, the animal disposition is in what, in what state are the animals right now? The female is confined at home. The male is deceased, unknown cause. He states, um, victim, I'm having a little trouble writing his, emergent, his um, writing. Victim states to emergency room staff that he was running, two dogs chased him. He sustained bites to both hands, I think, and left leg. ABX prescribed no solution. Action taken by health officer. Attempt to call victim, no answer. Clerk's office, he called them. He ascertained that the both dogs are up to date on their rabies shots and on their licensing. Mark also um, has submitted the report given by the hospital. 56-year-old male presents to the emergency department after being attacked by his neighbor dogs. Multiple bite wounds, mostly to the right hand, although he does have some small bite wounds to the left fifth digit and the posterior left thigh. Um, the rest is not relevant. They offered him a vaccine. He declined to take it. And that there's no evidence of rabies. Um, Anybody's welcome to examine these documents, but that's the relevant information. He has also submitted some pictures, and we can pass these around if people would like to see them. The first two were taken in the hospital. It's a picture of his hand and a picture of his thigh. Um, so that will be part of the record. Then he submitted another photo that was taken a day later which shows the condition of his hand a day later. And then a day after that, he took both a photo of his hands and of his thigh. So um, I'm happy to make these available to you folks if you'd like to examine them. Otherwise, we'll just put them in the record. All right. And uh, you guys have all seen these. Does anybody want to see them? OK. Sure. All right. Um, we cannot ask Mark any questions because he's not here. That's what we would normally do at this point. So now we'll ask. I have a question or a sure. statement. I'd like to say hi. I'm Gina Brown, and I live in the North Village. And I just wanted to say that I think that you need to be very careful with your dogs. Um, it's not just the dogs, but it's the dogs and the dogs are very close to each other. Okay. And that you need to be very careful with your dogs. It's not just the uh, that we have no evidence that there were any witnesses. Right, but so we'll why, be, we will be asking. Why are we judging a loose dog? Okay. That is, we're going to address that, but not right now. Okay, okay we're just. But that seems irrelevant mm -hmm. because this is the show around the pictures, okay? But we're not given the opportunity for the family. We are themselves. giving her an opportunity right now. So okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that there is justice here. Thank you. On both sides. So, Elsa, your turn. Can you tell me, we have this document that you submitted. Would you like to speak, or would you like prefer that we I read this? I would like to speak. Um, I, this is Elsa again speaking. Um, can I respond to a few things? That Absolutely. That statement Absolutely. Before I read my statement? Yep. Um, I'm concerned by the repeated mentions in that statement of these dogs are known to be aggressive this has happened before. That, again, is hearsay. I've learned this week that there are a lot of rumors and people who understand that my dogs are large and they have a loud bark and they run up and down inside their fence. But I have learned that a lot of people have made assumptions about them because of that. I don't know what other things he's referencing. And without him here to clarify for us, I, I, I feel that that's unfair hearsay to have in his statement without ability to question that. Uh, I'm going to start with the beginning of how I found out about this alleged attack, and then I'll give some back information about my dogs. Um, I was at my house on the evening of 18th. Uh, Lisa McCarthy, who is another neighbor and Alice resident who unfortunately couldn't be here but has sent a statement, was at my house. Um, she had come down to my house. We were going to take a walk after work with the dogs. We put them in their harnesses and leashes, and we started walking up North Palace Road. The black flies were horrible, so we decided walking was not a good idea, and we came back to my house. 
uh, we tried sitting on my porch, and again, the black flies were horrible, so we went inside. Um, and we were talking, and it was approximately 6 p.m. is the time I've come up with between looking at the texts from Lisa when we planned to walk, and then the text message that was the first thing that she sent me after I left to go look for my dogs. Um, I heard footsteps on my porch, and I heard banging on my door. My dogs always bark when someone comes into my driveway, and so I heard footsteps and knocking at the door, realized I hadn't heard the dogs barking, so that was my first indication that they were out. They generally are outside. They have a large fenced yard. I wouldn't necessarily know that they are out if I'm in the house. Um, they have a contained yard. Unfortunately, through some kind of human error, they got out that day. Um, so I saw his face, and that is, yes, the first thing I said was, oh no, are my dogs out? And he held up one hand. I, I think it was left, but I don't know for sure. That did have blood on it, and he opened and closed his hand at me, and he said, if I find them before you do, they're dead. And he was gone before I could ask any questions or really even process what happened. Um, he did not give me any indication where I might find them, which was upsetting to me because if this, you know, uh, if they were out and potentially hurting people, I would want to get them as quickly as possible. Um, but he was gone. I ran out and got in my truck. I did not even put shoes on. Um, I know the loops that Mark typically runs because he runs past my house frequently. Um, and so I started heading up and was going to drive up Emsley Road. Uh, the folks who live in the house on the corner that used to be Lisa McCarthy and Ernie Parishes were outside mowing. I rolled down my window and they said, did you see my dogs go by? And they said no. So I went the other way in my first loop around thinking if they, that they would have seen them if they went that way. Um, I passed Mark. As I was coming back down Emsley, I passed him still running. He still did not look like he was going to give me any useful information. Um, I stopped back at my house, yelled to my son who was in the shower, told him to get out of the shower and go up in the woods and on a snowmobile trail because the vast majority of other times when the dogs have gotten out, that is where they go, is into the woods behind the house. Um, and texted a few friends who live close by to let them know that I had been told you know, that the dogs were out and one of them, I just said the dogs are out. The other one, I said Dog, the dogs are out. Mark went and was threatening to kill them. So she also came and drove around looking for them. Um, it was my friend who actually found Paddington's body in the ditch on Robinson Cemetery Road and called me. Um, they did, as we heard, both have porcupine quills in their mouth when I found them. And my friend called me at about 7 15 uh, to say that she had found them. Um, so my dogs are both Great Pyrenees mixes. They have both always been kept up to date on their vaccinations and their town registration. Paddington was an absolutely beloved family pet, loved by everyone who knew him. Trixie continues to be a beloved family pet, loved by everyone who knows her. Several people who haven't been to my house before came to my house this evening before this meeting to walk down with me and met her and petted her and walked into my house with no problems. Great Pyrenees are a livestock guardian breed, and they are known to be very vocal as a way to protect their homes and livestock. I'm sure that all of the members of the select board are familiar with the loud greeting you get from my dogs when you arrive at the town hall. I have never had anybody approach me to complain about their barking or report that my dogs barking from inside the fence caused them to feel afraid or unsafe in any way. Um, this breed is also notoriously known to wander. And I've made multiple adjustments since I got Paddington to the way that I keep my dogs to prevent them from wandering. Um, the, we got Paddington in November of 2020. Um, in the winter, as a young puppy, he did not leave the yard. The first time he ran down out of my yard into the road um, in front of my house, I was there, I was outside, I ran down and got him. And after that, he was always on a tie out attached to the porch or on a leash if he was outside. Um, I then had, I started looking into having a fence built. Most of you probably remember it was very difficult during COVID to get anything done and get supplies, but I did hire someone later that summer to build a small fenced area. And then last summer we had a much larger fenced area built. Um, that said, on occasion the dogs have gotten out, as all dogs do. Um, I'd like to describe those incidents because I think they document some evidence that it's unprecedented and out of character for my dogs to have attacked someone without provocation when they were loose. Um, and I believe some of these people that I'm going to reference 
will be speaking or have submitted statements. Um, on one occasion during the spring or summer of 2022, I think before the larger fence was done, they got out and they went to the home of Pam D'Andrea and Jim O'Riordan on Doberbrook Road. Um, Pam contacted me and Pam and Jim fed them treats and entertained them in their yard until um, my daughter arrived to pick them up because I was at work. Um, this fall, on October 6th, a friend had dropped her daughter off at my house in the morning early before school because she needed to catch the bus from my house and her daughter as a visitor didn't latch the gate properly, which I did not realize at the time. Um, and so my dogs got out. Um, I discovered this when I got a phone call from Kathleen Landry. Um, I was at work um, and I then, I actually honestly, I think that my, some of my kids were home from college that weekend and one of them got them. I may have left work, I don't remember, but we immediately went and got them um, from Kathleen's house and she later sent me a text message following up. I included a screenshot in my statement that was sent to the board. Um, the text message said, hi, this is Kathleen Landry. I was visited by your sweet, sweet dogs earlier. I felt bad about being pretty on the phone. Never introduced myself, that's kind of irrelevant. Anyway, I'm glad they got home safe and sound and a bit money. And I said, oh no, that was fine. I thought it was you, but I'm also at work. Um, and she said, wait, who are you? And I said, oh, it's Elsa Ingpen. And she said, oh, Elsa, how are you? I love your dogs. Um, so that was her experience. She was able to call me because they have tags that have their phone number on them. And so she was able to approach the dogs, read their names and their phone numbers off their tags and call me. Um, just before Christmas this winter, you all may remember, we had some very bad wind um, and lots of trees came down. And a tree came down on the up section of our fence in the section behind the house, which is a wooded area and not just difficult to see from inside the house and not somewhere we walk in the winter. So we didn't realize right away that the tree had come down and the dogs got out a few times um, related to that. Um, first, because I did not know the fence, that the tree was down. Um, second, because I still didn't know. I thought that I had found where they got out. I was still a little puzzled, but I fixed what I thought it was. And they got out the second day. Then I found the broken part of the fence. I made a temporary repair, which didn't hold. So they got out three times related to that. Um, each of those times, they were found by people who reported them to be friendly and agreeable. Each of these people was able to easily approach the dogs, read their names and my phone numbers off their tags, and contact me to let me know where to find my dogs. Um, they were found once by Nell Emlin, who lives up on uh, the, near the top of Kent Hill Road. She contacted me, fed the dogs treats while I called my son. I was again at work and asked him to go pick them up. He was already out driving around for them at the time, so there was a slight delay because, as you all know, we don't have good cell service in Calais. Um, but he, as soon as he got the message from where they were, he went up to collect them. They had already wandered down Nell's driveway, but they were in Kent Hill Road and he brought them home. Um, they were found once on Apple Hill Road by Alexandra Whitelock, um, who again got, contacted me after reading their number. Um, my daughter went and picked them up, and when she got there, Alex commented on how sweet they were. And they were found once on the snowmobile trail by a man who I did not know. Um, he called me with a blip of reception and then followed up with a text exchange. Months later, this man stopped, saw me walking, um, stopped in the road to say hi, ask how the dogs were doing, and tell me again how beautiful he thought they were. Um, the text messages from him I've included. I don't know that I need to read them. They're just, hey, they are now headed on Robinson Cemetery Road, headed towards County Road. He sent me a photo of them in the road. Um, I said my son's headed that way to look for them. Um, he went later on that day, texted and said, I hope you found them. What kind of dogs are they? And I said, we got them. Thank you so much. They're both great here. And he gave a thumbs up text response. So after those three days, we made a permanent repair on the fence, and the dogs have not gotten loose again since that time. Um, based on the information above, I would respectfully ask the select board to consider the possibility that my dogs were provoked in some way when they encountered Mark Mark Whitman. I think we also have to consider, I don't know said he didn't see porcupine bugs based on what he described. I'm not sure that he would have noticed that they're white, long-haired dogs. Um, it wasn't immediately obvious to me when I found my living dog running in the road that she had working my quills. It wasn't until I got her into the truck, so it is possible that they were in pain and agitated from the working my quills. I do not know. Uh, but I, I have to consider that there may have been some other event that caused them to behave in this way that is completely out of character for them. Um, I would also like to take a minute to ask the select board to 
when you begin to allow other people to make testimony, please remember that last spring and summer, there were two Great Pyrenees living at the farm at the end of Pekin Brook Road. Um, I don't know the number. It was a newly built place with a big gate, and they have big greenhouses. Several of them were put in. They had two Great Pyrenees that were frequently loose. It was in front porch form on a regular basis. Um, every time it was in front porch form, I got multiple calls and messages from friends. My own mother once saw those dogs running and called me and said, I think I saw your dogs and they were not my dogs. Mm -hmm. So I would ask that if people are testifying about my dogs, they are able to confirm that they know that those dogs were my dogs, either because I was with them, because they were inside my fence at my property, or because they confirmed their identity on their tags. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm very concerned. I, I've never met those other dogs. I've never seen them. But I'm very concerned that they're running loose, and whatever mm -hmm. they may have done while they were out is, has been falsely attributed to my dogs in this town. Thank you, Elsa. I will give, um, do you mind if we ask questions? No. Okay, uh, but before we do, um, would somebody, this is, um, again, Barbara and Cole. This is their report of their interview. And again, Barbara, you don't want to read it. Cole, would you like to read it? Or it makes no difference to me. Okay. Thank you. Do you prefer to read it, Cole? I don't think you. Me too, Cole. <laughs> okay, this was, um, interview was done on Sunday, May 21st. Barbara, may, uh, can everybody hear Barbara? Yeah, you know, you know, have to talk toward the audience. Yeah, that's what I was okay. thinking. Could you, first, maybe if you came up here, Barbara, do you mind? Is this okay? Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, this interview was done on Sunday, May 21st. It was conducted between myself and act, I'm going to call him Acting Animal Control Officer Paul Bliss. Um, Elsa apparently has a series of, and this was um, simply my notes taken from that interview with Elsa. Elsa apparently has a series of gates that she uses to define where she has the two dogs secured within her property. She told us that Lisa McCarthy was at her house Thursday evening and they tried sitting out on the porch to visit. The black flies were so bad they had to go inside. The next thing she knew, she heard someone's footsteps on the front porch and that it was Mark Whitman who was very agitated. She said Mark's hand was bloody and that he told her that her dogs had just attacked him and he said, quote, I'm sick of this. If I find your dogs before you do, they're dead. She said Mark ran off and she realized that when she and Lisa had gone inside, she must not have gated the dogs inside the proper fencing. She said she left immediately to look for her dogs first heading down North Callis Road to Duber Brook Road. She then circled over Apple Hill and passed Mark still running on Elmsley. She never saw the dogs. She went back home to get her 19-year-old son, Silas, out of the shower to help her look for the dogs. She called a couple of friends to also held at, head, to also held head out looking for them. Elsa was on Jack Hill Road when she got a call from Erica Gongloff who had found Paddington, male, dead in a ditch on Robinson Cemetery Road by the Fitch Farm. As Elsa was driving up Kent Hill Road, she saw her female dog, Trixie, running down Kent Hill Road. She stopped to put Trixie in her car and realized Trixie had porcupine quills in her mouth. When she got to Fitch Farm and loaded dead Paddington into the car, she realized he also had porcupine quills in his mouth. I asked Elsa where Paddington is now, and she said she took him to Onion River Animal Hospital to be cremated. I also asked Elsa, did Lisa or Silas or anyone else witness Mark at her front door threatening to kill the dogs? And she said no, Lisa was in the bathroom and Silas was in the shower. I then asked Elsa how did she determine that the dog had been beaten to death versus being hit by a car, being hit by a car and she said because there was no blood. Elsa called the game warden on Friday morning to file a complaint for animal abuse by Mark Whitman. The game warden will interview Mark on Tuesday. After Elsa left, Cole noted that at times Elsa said the dogs never get out, and yet she enumerated four different times when they've gotten out and people have helped her bring them back home. 
And then I, had, I sent this via email to the select board, and I included Cole, and I asked Cole to reply all if there were any misrepresentations in these notes, or to please provide any corrections or further information he felt was missing, and he said that he agreed with the notes. Thank you. Cole, do you wish to add anything to that at this point, since you were present? No. Uh, no OK. All right. Select board. Did anybody like to ask questions of Elsa? Uh, I've got one. Mm -hmm. um, Paddington uh, was about two then? Two and a half. Two and a half. And how old is Tripsy? She's three. OK, thanks. How far is it from your house to Jimbo Reardon's house? Because of all the ones you said, that's like the furthest in my mind. So we live house. right at the corner of um, Apple Hill and Duke Road. Yeah. So I mean, I think it's, it's also hard to know if you travel by road, yeah. it's probably two miles. Yeah, yeah. terrible with distance. Yeah. That's not that far. You're going through the woods and the yeah. dog. It's I would suspect that, that they got there by going through the woods. Yeah. And that was over a year ago that they were All right, I have a question. Um, could you describe the fencing that you have for the dog, including how the door works, just so we have an understanding of what sure. you're doing now to keep the dog yeah, contained? Yeah, I can try to describe it. You're also welcome to come see it. You can see the fencing <laughs> along the road. Sure. Step that in. It's a little over. It's four foot wire sheet fencing, and then there's sort of a, a wooden lip above that. It's cedar fence posts most of the way. That's what's along the front. Um, you know, there's sort of different pieces. There's some picket up at front of my driveway. There's also some that's taller. So the first gate, when you come in from the driveway, latches and swings into the yard. And it actually had a like a sliding latch, but over the winter, the ground shifted. So it now has a hook and eye latch that I close. And then that sort of leads into the smaller section of the yard. And then as you come up the steps to my porch, there's a gate at the entrance of the porch that swings in and closes with a, a, like one of those drop gate latches, right? I'm trying to think of each oh, one. Yeah. Um, and then off the front of my porch, there's a double gate that one swings in and one swings out. And that was deliberate to make it harder to push so that the hinges are working against each other if you try to push against it. That has a sliding latch, I believe. Please don't quote me if I get the latch wrong. There's multiple kinds of latches. There's also a gate that we never use down in the front on the side towards the river. Uh, we never use that. I, I can't even tell you off the top of my head how it opens because we literally never use it. My son jumps the fence to go to the school bus in the morning. Um, and then at also facing the driveway on the side closer. To, so there's fencing sort of dividing where you walk in. There's a section of fence and then on the other side which is the bigger yard that my flower gardens are. There is a double gate that has a sliding latch. Um, we don't usually use that gate. That's if we need to open both gates to like drive something through to get to the top shed. So how many gates would the dog have to go through to get out? Is it just one? Well, it or depends. Is it, sounds like a series. There is a series, but what happened that evening is that Lisa and I were walking through and we went up on the porch, and the dogs were annoying me. They want another trait of Great Pyrenees is that they will paw at you incessantly because they want to be petted, and they were annoying me, and I had pushed them out in front of the porch and just closed that gate. Mm. Um, and I, I, I wish that I could say what happened, whether I didn't close it all the way. I don't know. And I, I didn't stop to look at the gates before I went to go look at them. So I think what I'm hearing is if you did not close the gate properly accidentally, I understand, there would have been no other hindrance to the dogs getting out. Right. Typically, okay. typically there always is. And I will regret until the day that I die that I didn't yeah. close either of those other two gates off the porch. Um, I was, they were just off kilter with tried to take a walk, tried to sit on the porch, and somewhere in there that got lost. And I hugely and enormously regret it. Now, you said the fence is four feet high? It's a little In fact, you just said feet. that your son can jump over them. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any reason to believe the dogs cannot jump over them? <laughs> yes. If, if nobody... Size, sorry. They, if, 
Everybody asks that question. If you saw my dogs, they don't want to get on the couch without help. It's really ridiculous <laughs> because they are very large dogs. They do stand up on it, but they stand up when we're sitting on the couch and they want to sit with us. They put their front feet and they loom over us, and we have to like. You have to like really encourage them. Like we have a running joke that she's like, they need help. You have to boost his butt. Um, they've never shown any attempt to try to jump over the gate. To your knowledge, then that's never happened. Okay. I, yes, I feel very confident that that has never happened. Okay. Other questions from the select board? Is there, does anybody have clarifying questions for Elsa? Anybody else in the room? Yes, would you state your name, sure. please? Uh, Carolyn Morton. I might have missed this because I'm in the back row, but did you, did you talk about uh, what was the animal hospital determined was the cause of death of the dog? Did, did I miss that? I feel that that is part of what we said we were not discussing tonight. That's, that's right, Carolyn. I think you weren't here in the beginning. That's just not, that's not an issue we're going to address tonight. We are only looking at whether there might be a, some kind of danger or threat to callous residents under the circumstances. Okay. I also feel a little uncomfortable that I am answering questions from everybody when Mark is not <clears throat> here to ask I asked questions. But, but you are getting a better chance to give us evidence than Mark is, so you can take comfort from that. OK. Yes. I'm Heather Scandale. I have multiple questions for Mark, mm -hmm. and I don't know how, how to proceed with the select board with that. And I'm wondering what that process is. And I would like to have an explanation of mm -hmm. when Elsa is having the audience to say what questions you have for her and the other person who filed the complaint, I have many questions for that individual. With what was stated, in addition to other anecdotal things that I have seen on Facebook with that individual being present at social functions with being fine with their what the medical report states compared to what I have seen. So I would like to know how the select board is going to proceed with that and how they're going to answer with, with that. I'm, I'm, I have a huge moral conflict right now with how this is being run, with Elsa being here present compared to the person that filed the complaint and we're not able to have that um, equal balance of questioning. So I feel like, what is the what is your procedure and how is that shut down? How do you perform that when the person okay. right, I would like to hear that yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, we can only make a decision based on the evidence we hear in the hearing. If we feel we have insufficient evidence and we um, understand that you may have questions from Mark, we do too, but we can't ask them either. However, at least Elsa can answer our concerns. So I would say you're in a better position to give us the evidence. In any case, if we feel that we do not have enough evidence to make a hearing, I'm sorry, to make a decision at the end of the hearing, we may continue the hearing and, and ask Mark to come in another time. But we're doing the best we can under the circumstances, OK? Um, do we need to talk about this more? Um, I would like to get on to other witnesses. I, I, All right, let's start with Maria. Um, so again, my name is Maria Molegos. Um, I feel like I have some expertise in this experience because I was the Palace Town Health Officer from 2015 to 2018. I have a lot of experience about how the town handles dog bites. I worked very closely with Wilson Hughes as the animal control officer during that period of time. Um, I have seen uh, many dog bites in this community. We know that loose dogs are not an anomaly in Calais. We know that dog bites are not an anomaly in Calais. Um, I have already expressed my concerns about why this is being handled in such a formal manner when normally dog bites and loose dogs are handled informally. I understand that you don't have the people in place um, to have handled that the way Wilson and I had in the past because you don't have the staffing. Um, but I also want to say that Per the dog ordinance, um, in terms of this being a first offense for both dogs, one of the dogs is dead, um, and the first offense uh, 
punishment consequence for the other dog, Trixie, would be if she were to be found uh, guilty of being a nuisance, would be $50 and we would be done here. So I feel like putting this family through this in, again when they have already lost a dog and the state will decide what the deal is with how that dog died. But I feel like we could probably move this along and, and not make it such an, a super heavy formal meeting when what we're really talking about is $50 and a little piece of paper in Elsa's file. Um, I think this is really um, upsetting for a lot of people. I can tell you that I haven't slept in a week and it's not even my dog. Um, so I, I kind of feel like maybe this has been beat to death as a really, really poor choice of words and maybe we could finish this up and let some people find some peace. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, hi, I have two parts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the part that if you, you please know, state school. your name. I, I'm sorry, I'm Dina Brown. I live in the North Dallas Village. Um, my two parts, I'm going to first start with, um, I have a family, um, I have three beautiful, precocious, vibracious children, um, they're very active, very busy, and we have seen these dogs on many occasions being walked by Elsa, and they have been friendly. Uh, um, let me just stop you because in a minute we are okay, going to turn. I, I, I have to go soon, so I want to make this present that they are friendly dogs and they have never shown any aggression towards my children who are extremely handsy and active. And I think my second part, I feel with my bones that you talk about the danger and the nuisance of something, you should really think of someone who makes a threat mm. to a family who has a dog that I'm going to kill them if I find them first. That is what you should consider a danger and a nuisance to this palace yeah, community. Free. Okay. Here, here. All right. I have to go. Okay. Thank I you. need to make sure my statement was heard mm -hmm. because that is more of a concern for me with children mm -hmm. and my senior citizen mother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. That, that's really not. Thank appropriate. you very much. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue right now with just clarifying questions for Elsa. Is there something that you did not understand about what she said and you would like to ask a question or you feel that more information from Elsa would be helpful? Could you now ask Elsa those questions? We are going to give everybody a chance to speak. Everybody I'm wants to a chance to speak. I'm not okay, go ahead. Um, I State don't have a question. Uh, Pam DeAndrea, I don't have a question for Elsa, but I do have a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. from Mark's testimony. Can I ask that even though Mark's yeah. not here from sure. whoever read it? Because I heard in the testimony that he grabbed Paddington by the neck at one point and I, I just, if I can just hear that again and also have the select board think about that in terms of being bitten by a dog. If a, a human goes to a dog's neck and grabs it, then that is going to provoke a dog. So I just want to hear that part in the testimony again. If, if you can read that one more time. And do you and have that? It went Chad Rose there. And just read that one more time and also just point out from dog behavior if, um, so keep in mind also, and this is not part of my testimony or anything, but dog behavior, if you see, if, if my, I have three dogs, and if someone is, is you know, um, a, you know, in a fight with one of my dogs, the other dog will bite. Right. So just Thank keep you. that in mind, that that other dog will protect. Okay. I, can't. I think so I, I can address her, her question. Yeah, I was, just I was the one who read that statement. I, I wrote it. Okay. Uh, the dog lunged at him. And so he, it was coming at him midair, and that's that's, that's where he grabbed it. Just, he wasn't just running; he actually was jumping. He was that's jumping. And Paul is here, so is that your understanding from what Mark right. told us yeah. when we interviewed him? Here oh, I'm sorry. It was Tegan. It was Tegan. What does it say in the statement exactly? Okay, so it said, <clears throat> Mark quickly turned around and caught the male dog by the throat in midair. In midair, I'm sorry, which would can suggest you read the sentence before Mark quickly turned around because I think what my dogs were doing before he turned around. Um, the part that he could tell when they spotted him, or that he sure. wasn't to be aggressive, or if you want to start with what he thought he could tell when he spotted them. Okay, I'll just start. Let's talk. 
As he approached Judy Bingham's work garage, he saw both dogs on the other side of the road before they spotted him. He knows them to be aggressive and opted to get on the far side of the road, not make eye contact with them, and run past. He could tell when they spotted him and knew when they were rushing him from behind. Mark quickly turned around and caught the male dog by the throat, collar, and midair. This is what resulted in the bites on the top of his hand while he was holding the dog by the throat in midair is when the female dog bit him in the back of the leg. So that gets, you know, clarity on that. And I think knowing uh, what, what, just knowing yeah. dog behavior and, and what precipitated okay. human grabbing the dog's head. Um, it's like this, more needs to have that information. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Heather. 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 Can you, I would like clarification of what Elsa, her background is and her um, qualifications because there was one moment in what the note stated when Mark came up to the door, it was stated that he was somewhat um, escalated. So I'm just curious, I would like um, Elsa to state her qualifications and what her background is. Sure. Um, I have a doctorate degree. I have a doctorate of nursing practice. I work as a nurse practitioner. I work at Express Care, which is a walk-in clinic. I frequently treat people with dog bites. Um, I also have extensive <coughs> social work background, working with people with trauma. I'm currently the school health director for Orleans Southwest Supervisory Union. Um, when Mark came to my house, and I put this in my statement because even in that moment, once if anyone else in this room is a nurse or any kind of medical professional, once you're trained to think that way, I look, I cannot not look at people and make instant medical assessments. That's how we're trained to think. So it was notable to me that yes, there was blood on his hand, but he opened and closed his hand when he held it up, which showed me that he had full range of motion, which was a good sign. He did gesture to his shorts and I saw that they were ripped. I did not see any blood or any injury to the skin in that area. Um, and I also, as I noted, saw him continuing to run home. I mentioned that the neighbors next door were outside doing yard work, so that was all indications to me that he was not seriously injured because he did not stop where there were other neighbors who could have let him use a phone. You know, I understand he wouldn't have wanted to ask me for help in that moment, but there were neighbors right next door who he could have asked for a ride home. He could have asked to use the phone to call his wife. Um, instead, he felt well enough to continue running a mile and a half straight uphill back to his house, which I can't do on a good day. Um, so that's, I think, so what you were asking. Mm -hmm. um, I was. Thank you. And I, again, without being able to have Mark answer this question, I would like to ask the clarifying question. He states clearly that he saw the dogs before him and he was near somebody's garage. I am not making excuses for any dog bite. That said, as someone who used to run regularly, used to run between five and 10 miles a day in this town, I've been bitten by a dog while running. I'm very cautious when I see loose dogs. I stop and I go the other way. If I have the opportunity that the dogs have not seen me or to go into a garage of somebody that I know, especially if they're dogs that I am afraid of and I believe things which he clearly stated he believed they'd been aggressive in the past, he continued to run past them, feeling afraid, feeling that he thought that they were a threat to him. And I, I think anyone who runs and walks and bikes in this town has incidents that they can talk about, about being chased by dogs. And again, I'm, I'm not saying this is good, but I'm saying there are choices we make as pedestrians and bikers in this town where there are loose dogs to avoid a problem, and then we call our neighbors afterwards. Thank you. The way in the back there. Yeah, John Dawkins from my corner. So you said the dogs were two and three and a half years old, is that right? And that's been out, and so you gave a, a story of like how many times they've been loose mm -hmm. in the town. Can you remember how many times that was? In my, I talked about once over the spring or summer, which I don't recall. Just the total number. I'm trying to answer your question. That once over the spring or summer, once in October when they went to Captain Landry's, and then there were three events related to the broken fence in the So that's a total of five? Yes. Um, and so the people that reported to the dogs loose, were any of them runners? 
Was I anybody don't running? I, one of them was snowmobiling. Like when that meal was I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, somebody else here? Yeah, you. Sarah Gallagher. I um, just would like to make a comment about the tone of this meeting and the people who are not here, who are uh, allegedly attacked by a dog, should not be demonized in defense of the dogs. They, 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 can we? Elsa and her family are not the only people traumatized here. It's really traumatic to be attacked by two big dogs. Mm -hmm. And I would appreciate if the same respect that people are asking for, for Elsa, could be offered to the victim of the attack. Thank you for that, sir. Other questions now for Elsa? All right. Thank you, Elsa. I know that wasn't easy. Um, at this time, we're going to open it up to other people who have evidence to testify. I have received, we have received several letters. Um, we received one from Greta Lauther, one from, we actually received two from Erica Gongliffe, but um, one of them relates only to the second incident, not to the first, so I'm not going to take that into evidence. We've got one from um, Cece Nell. Uh, Emlyn, Elizabeth Brown, and Lisa McCarthy, and Chantel Ekes. So what I'd like to do is ask somebody else, and maybe we could sort of take turns reading these into the records so everybody can hear what these people are saying. Then I'm going to give you folks a chance to offer evidence. All right? So may I ask either a volunteer to read them all, or at least to start? Thank you. Thomas, I will read all the to and from. <laughs> all right, this one is from Greta Lauther. <clears throat> no. Oh, no, uh, Heather just scanned over that. Oh, here. sorry. Yes. Um, can you state the relationship, please, of the person that wrote the letter to the, the incident? No, I can't. Because that's the wife of Mark. Okay. So I feel like that is like... I know, but we are clarifying who's friends with who, and it's a small community, so... <clears throat> so, Greta, to the Callis Select Board, I just wanted to share some of my experience relating to the issue of Elsa A. Penn's dogs being loose and the recent attack on my husband. Okay. I've heard from neighbors that these dogs have often been seen running loose on Apple Hill, and also know the dogs have been aggressive towards runners and bikers, including towards Mark on previous occasions. I also saw them once last summer going past my house following a scent trail where they continued over the bank below my house and disappeared into the woods. Although not at large in this situation, when I've walked past Elsa's house and her dogs are outside, they come running down and stand with their front paws on the top rail of the fence enclosure and their bodies well above the height of the fence, barking until I'm out of sight. I realize that although unple unpleasant, this isn't necessarily a problem and I may be wrong, but it makes me really nervous seeing how easily it looks like they could escape the fence. I don't have confidence that it's adequate to contain them and have been avoiding walking past there because of that. After what happened to Mark and hearing about a previous attack on a cyclist, <clears throat> my main concern is that these dogs are somehow getting loose and can be aggressive. I feel horrified by these attacks, which have been very traumatizing to Mark and all involved. <clears throat> And in thinking about how much worse things could have been, it was just incredibly lucky it didn't happen to someone who wasn't as strong as Mark, to a smaller person or a kid on a bike, for instance, and it was lucky it wasn't even worse for Mark. Most of my life, I've been walking the roads and trails around here and have learned where dogs are and their behaviors. And as long as they are on their own property or otherwise under control, that's a known quantity I can work around if needed. When dogs are getting loose, that isn't an option and becomes a matter of public safety. I really feel for all the trauma and hardship in this situation for everyone and sincerely hope something can be done in the best way possible to adequately prevent further harm or nuisance. Thank you so much for your attention to this matter. And that is the end of that. Um, is this the one, you took out the one from Erica that was? I wrote on it. Um, not relevant, okay. So not take that relevant, out. that's the okay. one. Yeah. So this is the one from Erica Gongloff that is 
pertaining to the uh, incident. Hello all, I've been a resident of Calais for 14 years and years ago had my own issues with our dog getting out and barking aggressively at people. We also had to come to a select board meeting and afterwards we sent him to some training classes at the shelter and worked really hard to keep him contained, but with kids in the house, sometimes he got out. We never had another incident and as he aged, he mellowed, he is no longer with us. I know Elsa to be a responsible dog owner. When her first fence seemed inadequate, she had another built. She has always been clear with visitors how to greet her dogs and helps make the transition. Paddington and Trixie are large and loud, and this can be taken as being scary, but they have big hearts. Elsa and I often walk with her dogs. I hold one and she holds the other, both on leashes, and I have never had a problem helping them to be calm and curious as people pass us, runners, walkers, bikers, strollers. My own children, age 13 and 16, have always been reluctant to be around big dogs, yet we often hung out with Elsa at her home and both kids enjoyed feeding them treats and getting to know them. My 16-year-old daughter was looking forward to dog sitting this summer and was talking about her plan to become Paddington's best friend in the world. We even put down our back seat and were looking for the dogs in this incident, confident that we could load them into our car safely and bring them home. While I understand sometimes issues like this arise and neighbors become adversaries, it is my hope that the select board will act as it always has, giving options, retraining, and understanding that these things happen from time to time, but there are ways to repair the relationship. As a school guidance counselor, I spend a lot of time working with children and adults about how to repair relationships, compromise, and take responsibility. In this particular situation, the dog in question, Paddington, is no longer alive, and that feels like more than resolution enough, especially given that the case was not natural. Unfortunately, I'm unable to come to the meeting in person today, um, but offer to answer questions at any time. Um, this one is from Nell Emlyn. I have another Thursday meeting, so I'm unable to attend this special select board meeting to discuss the incident involving Mark Whitman and Elsa Inkens dogs. I did, however, want to share an experience we had with Elsa's dogs. Like many dogs at near their own home territory, Paddington and Trixie bark when someone goes by and can sound scared. But on the one occasion when they wandered over to our home, we found them to be very friendly both with us and with our own dog. I have been bitten by dogs on several occasions, and of course that can be a very scary, can be a scary experience for anyone. I don't know the circumstances of the incident with Mark, but I hope it can be settled in a careful and thoughtful manner. Sincerely, Cornelia. And this is from Elizabeth Brown, who was here. Is this Dina, who was here earlier, for my clarification? Yes. No, oh. the, Elizabeth and Dina are not oh, the, the same person. Okay. Got it. Okay, so it asks to please read aloud. You have been given the task to determine what truly happened on Thursday of last week and how this situation should be handled. It is my sincere hope that you will listen to all the evidence to make a ruling that is based on truth and is fair and just. My family and I have lived in Calais for almost four years now. We love the area, the people, and seeing folks enjoy the beautiful trails with their beloved pets. While we have not met Ingrid or her family, I think she meant Elsa personally. We have seen her and her dogs walking the neighborhood, always unleashed, and I've seen them in their enclosed fence area when passing Town Hall. Our family has truly enjoyed seeing the beautiful white pups walking along happily and playing in their yard. When we have seen them out and about, we have seen folks pass by the dogs and have never seen them exhibit aggression or unsafe behavior towards others. When we found out about the accusations of what occurred, we were truly taken aback, given that in our experience, the dogs were always quite friendly and did not exhibit aggression at all. We are hopeful that witnesses will come forward and tell this story, because during this hearing, the whole story is not being told. While it is very difficult to, to, to believe that the dogs would have attacked someone, any dog, when provoked, will try to protect itself. Please take, please take time to listen and really understand the truth about what happened that day, as dog owners ourselves, we hope that the situation is handled without bias and with great care because often our pets feel like family. The family in this case has been greatly impacted by these accusations and have had their lives forever changed. Your ruling will either help to provide closure or cause even greater distress. Thank you for taking the time to read this statement. And this is from Lisa McCarthy. 
Um, unfortunately, I am unable to attend this special meeting tonight as principal of Lakeview Elementary School in Greensboro. I have a prior commitment at the school. I am available for follow up questions or to appear in person at a later date. I have known Elsa Ng Penn for many years and since the time she met Paddington and then Trixie, her great Pyrenees dogs. During the time she has had these dogs, she has been a responsible dog owner. This is evidenced by her bringing Paddington to Puppy Obedience School to ensure he was socialized during the COVID pandemic, intentionally introducing them to other dogs for socialization, my dog and Maria Maleko's dogs, introducing them to new people intentionally, building a large fence around her property and also using a large run to make sure they would not leave her property when unattended. Her dogs have a loud bark, which is typical for their breed. When I drive to Elsa's house, at least weekly, they bark loudly at the fence, similar to the way my Labrador Bridger also greets visitors. They have never left the fence area, area when I have been present. When Elsa or one of her children comes outside and calls them, they are redirected. As mentioned above, I have been at Elsa's house at least weekly since she obtained the dogs, and I have never experienced them being aggressive towards me or others. Additionally, I take walks four to five miles in length with Elsa on a nearly weekly basis with both dogs. Elsa has had them on a leash and harness during these walks, and when there is somebody passing by, she has them sit and gives them treats to reward good behavior, a technique she learned in her dog obedience class. She has been consistent in this approach. I have not seen her dogs be aggressive towards other people or animals during our walks over the past few years. On Thursday, May 18th, I was at Elsa in Penn's house. We were sitting in her living room talking. I excused myself to use the restroom in the upstairs of the house. When I was in the restroom, I heard two knocks, but it didn't initially realize there was someone at the door. It was approximately 6 p.m. When I left the restroom and was on the stairs, Elsa was in the doorway of the house. She looked upset and said, Paddington just bit Mark Whitman, and he said he's going to kill my dogs if he finds them first. She ran out of the house. I waited in the house because I thought she had ran to the road to get the dogs. A few minutes later, I noticed her truck was gone. I drove to Maple Corner store to buy a pizza. I saw Maria Malekos and shared with her what had just happened. I drove back down by Elsa's house to look for her and then returned to my house. From my house, I texted her at 6.50 p.m. and she said she was still looking for them. At 7.44, she texted me that Paddington was dead. Trixie had a mouthful of porcupine quills and asked for a number for the vet in Littleton, New Hampshire. I gave her the number. Elsa told me she couldn't talk and to text Erica. Erica Gongolov reported that Elsa had shared that one of the dogs bit Mark Whitman. She found Paddington dead on the side of the road above the sawmill on Robinson Cemetery Road. She told me he had clearly been hit. She said initially she wasn't going to help her look because Milo had a hard week and then it occurred to her that if Mark had said that, that he might actually do it. When I spoke to Elsa the next day, she told me that Mark Whitman came to the front door and knocked. She was surprised because her dogs usually bark. She reported he first appeared to have blood on his hand. He screamed at her, your dog bit me. If I find them first, I'll kill them. When she left the house, she asked neighbors at 1567 Kent Hill, which is that house up there, um, if they had seen her dogs and they had not, she drove up Kent Hill and then turned around. She drove up Emsley Road and passed Mark Whitman running. Oh my gosh, tiny script. <laughs> this is from Chantel Echhouse. They have aging eyeballs. Um, hello, Carolyn. I'm currently out of the country and saw your FPF post about Elsa's dogs. I live between Elsa and her ex-husband on Peking Brook Road. I cannot walk in either direction safely because Mike's dog attacked my dog while I was walking. I probably would have killed him if Mike hadn't heard me screaming and ran out to help. Walking towards Elsa's house, I have experienced her dog on at least trying to attack mine when I walked past twice now. If it ever got loose, I think it would kill my dog. When Mike and Elsa's dogs are together, I think they are much worse. His is a white Pyrenees and hers is a big husky type dog. After I finish, I would very much like this taken care of, but I will not be able to speak at the hearing. It is, not, it is terrible to not feel safe walking on my own road in either direction from my home. If there's anything I can do from afar, please let me know. Um, I'm assuming you want to rebut that? Her testimony. I would just like to say, um, say I'm Val Beatty, Arabella. Um, I live at my dad's house. Paddington does not live there, neither does Trixie. Um, we have three dogs. One is very old and um, does wander in the road. He's been hit by um, Chantel's husband before um, on the back road. And he's doing okay, but has back leg problems. But Paddington, um, 
does not live there. He was there for a few months, mm -hmm. I believe, in the very beginning when he was a puppy. Um, and he's no so, longer there. So you're saying this may be one of the instances when somebody confused mm -hmm. the two dogs. Yes. All right, thank you. I, I mean, you're going to have to trust us to a certain extent yeah, I, to sort through this information, yes. okay? Please. We understand hearsay is not admissible. Mm -hmm. thank you. And, and please trust that we are performing a role that we've been elected to perform with confidence because you guys have all elected us. Mm -hmm. So please trust and respect that we can filter through this for both parties. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, that is all the written testimony that has been submitted. Oh. I think that came in after Barbara printed. Yes, I haven't seen this one. Would you like to read it into the record? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Getting a little dry. <laughs> um, this is from Tracy Sudhalter. Good afternoon, Barbara. I'm Tracy Sudhalter, Mark Whitman's neighbor up on Apple Hill Road. I was planning to try and make the meeting this evening, but running on little sleep from a toddler up last night. I just wanted to share the following since I saw Mark on his way up the hill last week after he got attacked. My daughter and I were pulling into our driveway after her dance recital practice last week and saw Mark's clothes ripped up and him bleeding. He warned me just to be careful because he has seen me interacting with those dogs on the hill over the last year. They have been up and down our road a few times, two or three, in the last year, and obviously I don't want them to get hit by a car or be lost. I tried once to coax them in my car so I could check collars and get them home, as I would hope someone would do for me, and someone did last year when our dog Belle got out and took herself on an unauthorized overnight adventure. Just wanted to share that it does seem a bit like they get out more frequently than not, and I've never seen the owners post on Front Porch Forum that they are lost. When our sweet pup took herself for an adventure last summer, I posted immediately to Front Porch Forum and was driving around all night calling and informing every neighbor to please call if they saw her. No one has ever done that for these pups. Not sure if this is helpful, but wanted to share. Thank you. All right, I have a list of one, two, three, four, five people who've signed up to testify. And I realize I forgot to put folks under oath, but I please all tell the truth and nothing but the truth is <laughs> we do this, okay? So I'm going to call Doug Guy first. And if you're comfortable sitting there, that's fine. If you'd rather come up, that's okay, too. Okay. okay. Um, I'm Doug Guy. About 18 months, I was on my three-wheel electric bike going shopping in Maple Corners. Up at the top of North Dallas Road above Bill Davis's residence, I was coming down south. I saw Elsa walking the dogs on the right. As I always do, I pulled to the far left as far as I could go. As I came parallel to her, the dog attacked. Latched onto my butt. She pulled hard on the rope, and that slowed me around and threw me into the ditch with the bike on top of me. The dog continued to chew on me a bit. She said she couldn't help me because she had to try and get the dog off and when she let go, the dog hurt her more. At that point, a couple of young women came over to count in a car, and they stopped to help me. I never saw Elsa again. She took off with the dog, never any attempt to contact me. A couple days later, I brought the pants that were torn to pieces down to the town clerks, showed it to the town clerk and the town health officer, he did the check on the rabies vaccines. <clears throat> I was personally attacked and I had witness Elsa. So I'm, I'm just feeling like I'm going to be treated hostily here. Doug, what day, when did you say this occurred? Um, I, it would be mid-November. Of 2022? Uh, no. November 20, 2021. 20, 21, all right. Elsa, would you like an opportunity to respond to that? Do you remember the incident? I do remember. Uh, I 
not remember it being in November, but I, I won't argue about that. I know that I only had Paddington at that time, and he was a puppy, so I also would remind everyone that anything we think about Paddington, he is already dead. Um, that location was pretty similar in my memory to what Doug shared. I was headed, I'm terrible in this house, I was headed this way on Callis Road on that slight rise just before um, Andy and Carrie Felice's house. I did not know that Doug was behind me. Um, if any of you have been out walking and had an electric bike behind you, they're very difficult to hear. Um, so I did not know he was there until he was pulling up around me as he described. Um, I yelled to say, to alert him that we were there and I didn't know if he had seen the dog because he was on the leash in front of me. Um, he did not appear to hear me yelling. I don't know if he couldn't hear me because of the bike, I don't know. He cut his bike directly in front of me and actually crashed into the dog with his bike, which caused, did cause the dog to bite him and the bike to fall. As I was yanking the dog back, again, we were on that hill, um, and I had a torn meniscus at the time, so I fell backwards again, so I was a little slower in being able to help. There was a car that came, as he described, two young women who got out and were helping him. I, by then, had retrieved my dog, and I was standing back. He was still upset. I spoke to the women, and I said, I don't think that I can do anything to help. By staying here, I think the best thing is for me to take my dog away from this situation so that you can help him, and they agreed with me and said, yes, we'll help him from here. And as I left, they were helping him to get into his car, I believe. Um, I was never contacted about any notification to the town about that event. I'm not sure why I wouldn't have been. If that was reported as described, I can't speak to that, but this is the first time I'm hearing that that was reported. Um, I can also say that I have since seen Doug riding his bike past my house many times. He has also never attempted to communicate to me. When that happened, I had never met him before in my life, didn't know who he was, didn't have a way to contact him. Doug, do you want to respond to that? First, I did not cut with my bike in front. It's an electric bike. When the dog chomped on me, I tried to accelerate straight ahead on the left side of the road. I also pulled on the rope, and that put me like a toy on the end of a string. And that yanked me around in front and off that side of the road. Okay. So I did not cut in front of the dog. I was pulled to off that side of the road. Okay. Questions from the select board for either Doug. We're going to start with the select board. Uh, do you have a question, Barbara, or something to add? Not a question, but I can say that we there are official reports from the health officer and the animal control officer on that event, and they both visited Elsa, and we have those reports in the town office. Huh. Can I see those reports? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't have them here, but they're in the, because Anne explained to me that anything prior to a year was okay. not considered Perfect. an offense. Yeah. So I didn't bring copies, but we do have those in the town office. I truly have no idea what you're talking about, and I would very much appreciate seeing Okay. Those. Well, let, let the select board ask questions, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you. Does anybody have any questions of either Elsa or Doug about this incident? The select board. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Would you respect Do I hear one coming from you, Jordan? No, just a... A reminder that these questions are relevant to the testimony that's being given and that they should be clarifying questions to the individuals who are giving testimony. So as we work through the rest of this list, these people are giving testimony and these should be clarifying questions, not statements. All right, hearing none from the select board, um, Maria. My clarifying question was, this incident was older than 12 months, and the dog in question has already been, is already dead. Um, so I guess I don't really have a question, but it doesn't have anything to do with Trixie. I just want to make sure So that that's let me ask a clarifying question about that. Was Trixie present? Only one dog was present. Only one dog, okay. okay. I think you mentioned two earlier. That was just one dog. Okay, thank so you. I did not. between the two. Okay. It was just one dog and on a leash. All right. Other clarifying questions to either of these two people? Yeah. I have a clarifying question. I'm Heather Sandow to the select board. I would like to know, moving forward, if people have comments in the greater audience and it's prior to this incident, how will you address it? 
This gentleman talked about something that was prior to what we are talking about, and you did not shut that testimony, down. Testimony of a pattern of behavior would be evidence toward a pattern of behavior that helps us evaluate whether or not there is a danger to the community. It does not necessarily influence any decisions or actions relative to calculating offenses, but it would be a testimony about a pattern of behavior. I understand. I do question because we are speaking about a dog who is deceased and the comment was about the dog who is deceased. Mark Whitman's <clears throat> complaint Correct. is about two dogs, one being Paddington who is deceased Correct. The other one is Trixie, who is alive. This gentleman is talking about Paddington. I, I do feel the select board should address that and have shut that down, and I'm just wondering about that. We're trying to be respectful to all parties I understand. here. And, and so the other thing to keep in mind is that out of this proceeding, we have to make a declaration of a statement of facts that then inform our decisions and whatever we decide could be remedial actions. So even though there are testimonies, not all testimonies are going to be determined to be factual or a fact that is then going to be contributed towards our decision. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for clarifying that. Does anybody Thanks. disagree with that? No, no that was very well said. Thank very you. Well. Um, I, did I see another hand up here? <clears throat> okay. Then thank you, Doug. Can and I just clarify my own statement because I feel like sure, I don't go want ahead. my words to be twisted? I know I said that I see Doug going past my house on his bike. I had not seen him. The first time I ever saw him was the day of that incident. I have since seen him at that time. I had never seen him before. I still did not know his name or how to contact him. Okay. I learned his name tonight. Thank you. All right, Kathleen Landry. Is Kathleen Landry in the room? She's one of the ones we read, I think. Um, she, oh, I, she, but she course. signed. She, she actually signed. She, she may have sent to me. Okay. I did read the text messages <laughs> from her. Okay. Uh, Pam DeAndrea. Yeah, Pam DeAndrea. Um, Elsa mentioned me before and that um, her dogs came to my house once and they were, I just want to state, they were nothing but lovely, friendly. Um, also to my husband, I have three dogs myself, and one of my dogs was the one that wasn't the nice one of the pack that was happening, and I had to contain her um, because she's not very good with other dogs, and I keep her, try to keep her away from other dogs. Um, but Elsa's dogs were wonderful, and I was able to give them treats and put them away in my home until Bill was able to come and pick them up. So I just want to, you know, that, that's my personal experience with those dogs. Um, I have done um, a lot of training with my own dogs and have also um, gone to uh, an expert up in Walden to train my oldest dog, Cody, who um, was a little aggressive when he was a puppy and learned a lot from this woman. Her name is April Frost. And she writes explicitly about um, dogs that may bite out of fear, and one of those things, if, if a dog is feeling provoked, they may bite. And I'm worried that this may have happened to Paddington. And another thing with dog behavior, when you have two dogs that were as close as Paddington and Trixie, when one dog is being handled by a human, if, when that is happening, and I don't, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened to Mark. I don't know what provoked this incident. I have no idea. But when you, when, when a dog sees their their alpha dog, their partner dog, um, in an interaction, they will attack. So Paddington is gone. There's nothing to do about deciding what happens to Paddington. What's here is what um, happens with Trixie. Trixie, had, there's, I've never, I haven't heard one thing today that Trixie has ever done anything except for Mark's testimony. Any dog 
would do that if their partner dog was in an altercation. So that's that would happen to my any of my three dogs. They would react that way. I live right near Mr. Whitman, and I am very concerned. I contain my dogs with an electric fence. My dogs are very good about staying within that fence, but power goes out, you know, and then the electric fence doesn't work. Um, we try and keep them inside when that happens. My dogs have gotten loose on occasion. It happens. I would like to know any dog owner that that hasn't happened to. The, the dog in question is Trixie. And if we're worried about Trixie getting out again, that could be any dog in town. And Trixie has only, according to Mark, done this one thing. And that was in defense of her partner dog. So that's, that's the knowing dog behavior and the experience that I had with training and with going to this expert up in Walden, Vermont. I, I just know a lot about this and I fear for my own dogs because they do bark. And Mr. Whitman runs by my house just as often as he would run down this road. And I'm not stating, feeling like this is not traumatizing to him. I'm sure it was. However, my dogs bark crazy at him when he goes by because I have a hound, and that's what they do. And I am worried for my own dog's safety in the future if they would somehow get out of their electric fence. So just want to put that and just really keep in mind dog behavior and what dogs would do, any dog would have done. Thank you. What Qu Trixie did. Questions for Pam? Select board? So, Pam, other than this one training you had, have you had other training? Um, no, that, that was with my dog, Cody. With your dog, Cody. Yeah, <laughs> but I have trained my other two dogs. Based on um, Based on what I learned and from her. And they stay within their perimeter. Um, okay. I just want to. The one that I have trouble with is the middle one. She's not good with other dogs, and that's because I got her when she was over one year old. I couldn't catch her at puppyhood. And you've interacted with these particular dogs yeah. several times, several and in times. your opinion, um, Paddington was the uh, alpha dog. Is that right? I think he might. He was first, so you know they got Trixie afterwards. So normally, that's mm -hmm. how it happens. Whoever mm -hmm. is first. There, then that you know that dog is the alpha, and then the others learn from, from that dog. I understand. Okay. But but they learn, you know, they, it's not that. So Trixie maybe you know may have um, they they learn how to interact with you know the the humans in the family, and they so they learn how to be loved and how to be part of the pack. So the family's kind of part of the pack as well. It's not just the dogs too, but the family as well. But dogs don't necessarily like. My other two dogs didn't learn, like my, my oldest dog was very um, aggressive as a puppy and I quelled that. I was able to quell that with the training that I learned. Um, my other dogs were never, never like that. And they all have their own personalities and their own, their own ways. But really, any dog would, would protect their other dog. Thank you. Uh, uh, questions from anybody else for Pam? All right, then, Heather. Um, so I'm wondering, or my statement would be, I feel that has Paddington has died and passed away, and I'm wondering um, how it's unfortunate what happened to Mark. Very unfortunate. I think that is a scary thing. We can all agree that that, I mean, I've had that happen to myself. I'm not gonna like minimize any experience that he, he experienced. It's scary, it's frightening. I'm wondering how we can tell the difference between Trixie and Paddington. They look very similar. And Paddington being the alpha, I'm just curious about that piece. Are you asking how we can tell the difference? How Mark can tell the difference? What do you mean? I think when a decision is being considered, 
I think it's very hard to determine when you are looking at two dogs that are very similar stature. When you, I look at them in the pictures, they look similar to me. It's very hard to say who attacked, who didn't attack, who was the alpha, who maybe potentially bit the shorts or bit the hand. That's hard to determine mm -hmm. when it's one person that had that happen. Mm -hmm. I'm validating what happened to him. I'm not minimizing it. It's very scary. I've had, I've, we can all sit here and, and probably have had that experience. It's frightening. However, I do feel that is a determining factor when the select board is thinking about consequences or next steps. How you can determine which dog actually did that and what the next steps are for the appropriate accommodations or consequences to the, to the dog owner. It is not something that is objective. It's very subjective and it's very one person stance. And I hope the select board takes that in, into consideration. Okay. Thank you. Quest other questions for Heather? I looks like we've got one in the back there. Well, I'm just wondering um, if Mark claimed that it was Paddington versus Trixie. I believe uh, what Mark said was it was the yeah. male dog. Oh, okay. Can, can I, I answer, answer to that? Uh, just a minute. Are you finished? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, you can answer. I. Oh. <laughs> All right. I do believe that Mark knows the difference between my dogs. He runs past my house probably daily. I'm not always home, but almost daily I see him run past my house in the afternoon. We have seen him several times when we've been out walking and he's run past us. Um, so he has seen my dogs. He saw Paddington when we just had Paddington and they, he is larger and he has a different color. And, um, if it was someone who I didn't know ran past my yard that regularly to see my dogs, I would agree that he wouldn't know. But if, if Mark says that Paddington was the one who initially lunged at him. I'm inclined to believe that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions on this one? All right, then, Leslie Matthews. Hi. Um, I want to be clear. I'm just offering um, this uh, testimony as facts of something that happened at our home. Um, so I live on the class four portion of uh, Apple Hill Road next to Alice Blake Luck's property. On the morning of Tuesday, December 20th, 2022, two very large um, light colored dogs showed up on our property near the back door of the house. I know that was the date because we exchanged emails with our neighbors about these dogs and I saved the emails. So when I learned about this hearing on Front Porch Forum, I um, look back for those emails. Um, I tried to approach the dogs when they were um, next to our house to see if I could befriend them and look at their tags so I could contact the owner. Uh, however, at least one of the dogs growled at me and I felt threatened so I backed off. I yelled at them several times and was ultimately able to drive them off just by yelling and keeping my distance. My husband emailed our neighbors, Nathan Longo and Mark Whitman, and described the dogs to try to find out who they were and who might be the owner. Both neighbors told us that they were Great Pyrenees, they had both seen them before, and that they lived down in Gospel Hollow across from the town hall. My husband also spoke with two other of our neighbors on the north side of Apple Hill Road, one reported that the dogs had been in her yard that day as well. The other had been in his barn that morning and hadn't seen them. I was very concerned because we usually free range our chickens during the day. They never leave our property um, and we free range them when we're home. I don't like the idea of stray dogs running uncontrolled on our property because I fear for the safety of our chickens who are also pets to us. Fortunately, we hadn't yet let our chickens out the morning the dogs visited. 
I also feel fortunate having seen the injuries our neighbor Mark suffered that I wasn't attacked by the dogs when I tried to approach them. That's it. Thank you. Um, Elsa, I'm guessing that was one of the times they were out just before Christmas. I'm guessing that it might have been. But you don't, you can't remember. Do you have to remind people that there are other large white, a pair of large white gray Well, that's that why I asked the question that. whether we know that the dogs were loose at that time. No, I do not you know. You do not that know. Was. Okay. Um, well, December 20th would have been one of the winter stories right. where the well, power so, went so out. So I said it, it could have been. In that window, but I do not know that. Um, I, I don't have any information from that date. Um, I sort of hit or miss. Which text or emails I saved or deleted, I wasn't obviously anticipating needing to delete things. Okay. Thank you. Questions um, for Leslie? Anybody? All right. Thank you. That's the end of our um, list of people who've signed up to testify. At this point, I would ask, is there anybody else who wants to testify to offer evidence? Um, yes, you want to testify I, again? I just want to comment on a few of the things that were in the statement from, I believe Tracy said something, um, who commented about being concerned that she had never seen a post on front page forum about my dogs being missing. <laughs> I think it was the one that came in late. Yes, that yes. halter. Um, I just want to address that that is very true. On the occasions my dogs went out, I did not ever post on front porch forum because there is too much time delay. Front porch forum is released, released once a day. So anytime that I was aware that my dogs were out, I immediately sent my children driving around. I have two teenagers who drive and have their own cars. If they were home and available, to drive and search with me, I sent them, and I use Facebook Messenger to send group messages to neighbors who live on any of the roads where I thought they might go. Um, I just, I felt like that characterized me as not trying to find my dogs, and in every instance, the minute I've known that they were out, we immediately were out driving the roads and contacting everybody, but just not via that for, I didn't want to wait eight hours for a first warm to post to show up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I'll add, I, I'm one of those people that's but, contact, yeah, not I, contact with the I that. Um, so if nobody else wants to offer evidence, at this point we're going to close the evidentiary portion of the hearing. Um, what will happen is at the end of this, I'm guessing we're going to want to continue this hearing just in case. At, we're going to go into deliberative session. We may do that tonight. We may do that another time. If we find that we don't have enough evidence to make a decision, we may try to gather more evidence. We may not. But just in case, what we'll do is we'll adjourn it to a date certain. Um, and then if we don't find we don't need more evidence, we will um, close the hearing we'll, at, at our next uh, actual meeting. All right, so that's the process. Um, however, I don't, um, I want you folks to have a chance to talk about your concerns uh, and to, you know, just discuss what we might do. So at this point, I'd like to ask, are there people who would like to speak? No? Well, that's easy then. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, all right, you just came yeah. to listen. Yeah? No, I guess I would just be kind of concerned on whether or not any additional commentary would create a bias in decision making about consequential stuff. So whether or not well, we could actually hear that. That's why I'm calling it a, you know, I think we've heard a lot of, a, yeah. a, over the time, we've heard a lot of things that could bias us that we will consider hearsay or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the things we heard outside of this hearing. And I think we're pretty good at sorting that stuff sure. out. Can I just make that this is non-evidence comment for something in the future? Now that I have, I have not ever read our dog ordinance as carefully as I have over and over in this week. Um, as a medical professional, I have a concern that there's a distinction in our dog ordinance about a dog injury requiring medical attention versus not requiring medical attention. Um, Evidence-based practice standard of care anytime someone has an injury with a broken skin sustained from a cat, dog, or human bite, antibiotics are indicated. So by that standard, 
basically every injury inflicted by an animal requires medical attention. So I just think at some point in the future, we should revise the dog ordinance to reflect in some way how will we determine what we consider minor versus more serious. I can tell you as a healthcare provider, the vast majority of dog bites that I have seen in clinic that I've taken care of personally or that my colleagues have, um, we have the person wash their wound with soap and water, we give them a three to five day prophylactic preventative course of antibiotics, encourage them to dress the wound, update their tetanus vaccine if indicated, and send them on their way. Uh, so that is standard of care. That has nothing to do with the severity or not of an injury. It could be a nip from an eight-week-old puppy or a I true see. attack. I see. Okay. Questions? Would that also then, I mean, that kind of also negates any kind of emotional uh, stress or damage caused by that as well, though. Right. I'm, I'm just saying the way the wording is where it, it says of an injury that, I, I'm going to get the word wrong, but something like an injury that does not require medical care. Right. It's not a and, proxy for severity is what you're saying. Right. And right. any person who has a dog injury who contacts their medical provider and says, do I need to go to the ER or urgent care, their medical yes. provider is going to say, yes, you do. Yeah, for sure. So that just, I, I'd like us to think about, again, sometime in the future, how to write that more clearly because I think it will provide better guidance in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, wait, we're going to discuss the dog ordinance now, or are we talking about <laughs> 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 All right, go ahead, Maria. No, I just, I just wanted to say, I think one of the things that hasn't been discussed is the fact that, you know, the dog ordinance is a thing that has been around for decades. It's a thing that has been around for decades. It's a thing that has been around for decades. It's a thing that has been around for decades. It's a thing that has been around for decades. A nuisance animal can be an animal that makes you feel uncomfortable because they are at large and you are trying to enjoy your community. We all understand that, right? We don't, there's nobody saying Mark wasn't hurt bad enough to have this conversation, yeah. okay? Oh, I, I think we picked that up. Everybody yeah. understands that it is a traumatic, stressful situation. Yeah. Again, I have two dogs fenced in in my yard. Um, they make a lot of moves. They are dogs. My Coco Bean's second name is Coco Bear because that's the energy she brings to the table. But I feel like we also need to separate the way people feel about seeing dogs in a fence and barking at them, which is a source of great joy to dogs, um, and whether or not those dogs are actually dangerous. There's a difference between I see Elsa's big dogs behind their fence and it makes me uncomfortable, and those dogs are truly a nuisance. So I, I feel like there needs to be some, and I can tell you that I'm pretty certain in the town of Palace that Elsa and I might be two or four people who have fences in their yard to try to contain their dogs. So I do think that the expense of fencing in a yard, which I can tell you is extreme, and the thought process behind it, and the time it takes, and the person to find who will build you a fence way the heck out here, um, ought to be taken into consideration as well, in terms of the responsibility of the dog owner. Thank you. Um, dogs are sometimes awfully impossible to keep inside your okay. property. Leslie. I just want to make one more quick statement um, that isn't part of the evidentiary hearing. Mm -hmm. um, as a chicken owner, I know that might seem silly to people, but we feel very strongly about our chickens and we take very good care of them and we um, allow them to free range on our property without ever leaving our property. I certainly know that if one of our chickens left our property and was injured, that would be my responsibility. But I hear a lot of talk about how, at this meeting, about how stray dogs running around town are just a thing that happens and that's the way dogs are and it's not preventable and so forth. And as someone who, you know, raises livestock and cares about it, it's a little distressing to me to think that, and I, and I read from Porch Forum and there's almost yeah. daily some other dog is, is loose and you know, the concern is for finding the dog, and I understand that because I'm an animal owner too. But I am pretty distressed about the notion that stray dogs running around town are just something we have to live with because dogs aren't containable or these things happen. 
when I live in fear, basically, that my chickens are going to be killed by a domestic dog that runs straight on our property. So I, I just wanted to make Thanks. that statement. Okay. Do you have chickens? Sure do. I bought you. Okay. But I don't know when I see a stray dog on my property whether that's a dog that would threaten chickens or myself or not. Right. So hearing a lot of stories about how friendly the dogs are isn't that helpful to me. Because when I see two dogs that I've never seen before on my property near my chicken um, housing, I, I don't know. I feel threatened. Thank you. I think you, would you state your name, please? Can I just clarify, are we done with evidence or not? We are done with evidence. Okay. We're, I'll, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to say that my daughter. Would you state your name, please? Judy Vane. Thank you. My, it was my mom <laughs> when this happened. <clears throat> but that's not what I'm talking about. My daughter lived here for several years uh, in the Gallagher house. <clears throat> She had a large dog, a rescue dog, and um, she, the dog didn't, was really dangerous with other dogs, not with people. But she kept the dog on a tether at all times. And I failed to understand why, even though one might have a fence around their house, why big dogs can't just be tethered, and why that can't be a requirement. I know it's not so much fun for them, but <laughs> at least, and I too have noticed so many calls for help, dog lost. It means the dogs are free, and I as a 90-year-old person living on the corner of Kent Hill Road and having dogs running around, and my garage is where I keep my car. It makes me a bit nervous, because you never know whether a dog will like you or not. It may be a perfectly wonderful dog, mm -hmm. but it may take a dislike to you. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting Tether as a You see, I've seen several hands up. Uh, Doug. Um, I live on Dover Brook. We've been here since 59. And for 40 of those years, we raised poultry. And we lost a lot of birds to dogs. Half the time, we never got to see the dog. We'd go down in the barn, and they're dead. One year, it was 18 mature dead turkeys were left there. That cost me hundreds of dollars. So it is a concern of anyone who's got poultry about significant losses we face. I may be wrong on this, but I had the understanding from a long time ago that Dog license fees were supposed to be part of a fund to pay for damages to livestock? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know if that's a perfect a good point. Right <laughs> but it's, if you don't find the dog, you just take your losses, and that makes you uncomfortable when you see dogs around the place with animals. So it's not a casual issue. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn Morton. I'm just wondering, I, I know we don't have time tonight for everyone to tell their dog stories about times they've been intimidated, or maybe not bitten, but, you know, one of those moments when you're walking and you, it all works out okay, but I think, I think it would be great to have a chance at some point, at another time, to get feedback from the community about things that have happened to them firsthand, because I have like six in my back pocket from a bunch of years. And I, my kids were bitten years ago. I've never been bitten, but I've certainly been scared witless numbers of times, and some sometimes very recently. So I wondered if, if you could think about having another evening where, where people could share their experiences, because I don't, I don't talk about those experiences with many people. My husband hears my stories when I come home, but I wondered if there would be a chance for just getting feedback from the community about what they're experiencing. And I mean, I think there's a there's a law there is isn't there a leash law that you're not allowed to have your dog running free. I you do know. Know. No, no, there's not. Okay. Okay. It, I mean, I read the ordinance. And yeah. Dogs at large 
meaning off the property and out of the owner's control. That would be off the property. Running at large means the dog is not under the control of the owner at all times. Right. Yeah, I mean, if I'm taking a walk, which happened recently, and a dog ran off of this property and, you know, ran at a high rate of speed towards me, and I started to freak out. My husband was a witness to this. And I froze, because I, I'm, I don't have dogs, and I don't, you know, they know I don't know dogs. <laughs> I froze, and the owner, you know, I, I did what I do when I when that happens. I said, hey, you know, tried to talk calmly and not look directly. And then the owner yelled, the owner heard this because it was a distance away and then um, called the dog back. And I, I yelled out to the owner, hey, you know, your dog just charged at me. And he's like, oh. We heard this a million times. Oh, he's friendly. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that. And I would hope that in your, this isn't pertinent to the specific, and I realize that. Yeah. But I would that's hope fine. that in your determinations, mm -hmm. don't forget the emotional toll that these things take. And you don't need to break skin, and you don't need to present at the ED to be, I'll, you know, those memories stay with you, and it informs the next time I take a walk. So, mm -hmm. I would, I would appreciate if we could have that discussion sometime down the road. All right, I've made a note of it, thank, thank you. you. Uh, somebody, I guess you were next, then, Pam. Yeah, I want to address what you said, Leslie. I, I hear your poultry is very important. A lot of people in town, many of my close friends that do raise birds and have had issues with dogs. And, um, I don't think what, I, I wasn't trying to say that it's okay to have your dogs loose. That's not, what this was about. I was, and I don't think that's what Maria was saying. I, I think this happened by Elsa's very unfortunate error of leaving her gate open, and she said she would regret that for the day, you know, for all her days. Human error happens. I have three dogs. I live near you. I'm up on the other side of Apple Hill. My dogs would never come up over Apple Hill. I keep them contained with an electric fence. Tethering a dog is inhumane. I'm sorry, but I know that from April Frost, the expert up in Walden. They feel completely confined. Like, it's just not, I did it with one of my dogs and it made her behavior worse. From a behavioral perspective, tethering is not okay for a dog. I, 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 feel very, very strongly about that, so please don't recommend for Trixie to be tethered. It will only make her angrier. So, please, I think I'm speaking right now, thank you. Um, yeah, just please let please, her finish, and then you can speak if you I wish. just wanted to speak to tethering. It's, it's, not, it's not good behaviorally for a dog okay. to be tethered. Thank you. I know that. And I don't think we're saying that it's okay for dogs to run free. It's not. I keep my dogs contained. Elsa keeps her dog now she only has one dog, Trixie, is left in the fence. That's what's on the table here. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to think about. And I, as a dog owner, she is responsible to keep Trixie in the fence. And Trixie is not a nuisance. I have three dogs, and I really, really feel almost like, you know, talking about I don't know whether a dog's going to be friendly to me or not. I understand that fear, but I know I feel like I know dogs better than people in life sometimes. And those dogs that are friendly, if an owner says they're friendly, if someone's going to tell me that I have to put a leash on my dog to walk a callous trail, when I know my dog is not aggressive and is great with other dogs and people, I'm going to take offense to that. I will not let my dogs run loose. My dogs will not get your chickens. My got dogs, one of my dogs went to the Cruz house once years ago when I had a baby come home who was terrified of the dog. And my dog was threatened with gunshots. So let's just not talk about that one. But I just, you know, things will be, things will happen. Dogs will get out by human error. Humans are not robots. 
Dogs will get out by human error and beyond their control. Sometimes, that's reality. It's not saying that all of our dogs are going to run wild throughout callus. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what everybody has said. It just once in a blue moon happens. That is reality. So the, the once in a blue moon, it, it and that's addressed in the policy, right? Exactly. Like that's why there's a year right. thing. That's for just exactly. loose dogs, exactly. right? Loose dogs, however, that are fighting people exactly. might be a different story. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay, That's, we're we're uh, beginning we're to get. You guys, <laughs> pay up the chair. That. That's what I want to say. We're beginning to get into the discussion that Carolyn wants us to have, which um, it sounds like a good idea. We probably should, but let's not do that tonight. It's already eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah. I to ask, Did you want to make a statement? Well, yes. Would you state your name, we're, please? We've got a lot of political stuff going on. This isn't all about evidence or anything here. Yeah. Yeah. And there's quite a few statements. I don't raise chickens anymore because of dogs. I come on to my property constantly because I live next to the road. And, and this woman's saying, you don't have a leash law. Well, I know we don't have a leash law, but we should have one. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a discussion at least because the dogs were impacting my life and threatening me on a regular basis. Now, I don't even know who these dogs are. All right. I'm, so, I'm hearing it. And I hear these other stories, and I just keep, and I just know this story myself about my, now I'm hearing other stories. I think you all need to address this. Well, I, I think we're hearing know. that. We're hearing that people want to have a town-wide discussion about this. So we'll, uh, we are a little overwhelmed with work right now. I don't think we'll get to this immediately, but I have it on the list. Okay. Okay. Yes, Heather. I just want to thank the select board. I think that like there's a lot of comments and feelings and emotions, and I really appreciate like leaning in on the process. I think like when people have things they feel passionate about in this town, there is a process and we can stick to the procedure, it's really helpful. And so I think when people have really passionate stories and like really like experiential, like they feel passionate about like what's happening to them, like there's a process to like to go through, it's helpful. And so that seems evident in this like case for Mark and for Elsa, for it to stick to that process. I mean, it's not a policy, but a process, a procedure. So I think that's helpful that we just kind of like lean into that and follow that. Thank you. Yes. I'm Tina Collins. I just have a question. Is there a policy or a way that says that it should be reported to the town? Like what actions you take if you do feel, I mean, going to somebody's house and threatening to kill their dog isn't part of that, right? He, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That was my concern here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here. I have dogs, and we keep them in our yard as much as possible. And human error, they've gotten out. Anybody threatened to kill my dog? I, 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 that, I mean, he's admitted that I, that's just horrible. I mean, there, there is a process. And I'm just, it's not, I don't see it. Uh, no, I, you're right, I don't see it there, but um, we do have a, a, a process for filing. Uh, it's all right, it's okay. Um, and Mark did follow that process. He went, he came to the town and he filed a complaint and we followed up. That was three, three I know the town, the town's closed on Fridays and Saturdays. That's correct, Sunday. that's why he waited till Monday. But uh, Elsa did contact the town prior to Monday, correct? <clears throat> Not that I'm aware of, no. She knocked her bark on Sunday. We got to to her. You had to pray. Right, because the ER contacted you, right? No, because we had heard that Mark was I going see. to file the complaint, I and I knew that, Elsa, that um, Elsa worked, and I thought the best time to get her would be Sunday. Mm -hmm. So we asked Barbara and our animal control officer to be maybe, um, I just, well, I just didn't know if there was like a, a procedure to yeah. support it. Or... You, you're going to have to bear with us a bit. As no, you know, I, we're I, all brand new here, and right. we are feeling our way through this, it's like unique. a lot of us. 
Um, we're doing mm -hmm. the best we can to be fair and to come up with a no, solution that's that just, it's just, makes everybody it's, happy. I mean, to have somebody that's around that, you know, threatens to kill a dog and then the dog is dead. We're not addressing I know, that. I know. That's right, but that was, I, I, that I, was the steps that yeah. you took. And I'm just wondering if they were steps. Oh, she filed, she filed a complaint with the game warden, and I believe the game warden is investigating that. No, but steps to report a dog attack, like, is, it, is there, you know, is there a process that you just call the town? Like... I think Jamie wants to say something. I just want to, I just want to clarify that um, Mark approached me Friday morning as a select board member. Okay to report the incident oh, okay. and ask what the process was. Mm -hmm. And new to all this, I didn't know what the process okay. was. So I said, I will, we'll, we'll get back to you, mm -hmm. I'll follow up, I'll figure it out. I contacted the town clerk's office and Anne and uh, Barbara and Tegan over the weekend started the process, started okay. the conversations, had the follow up conversations. So the official report happened Monday, the Monday. next time the right. office right. was open. Right. But yeah. the process started as soon as Mark made his report first thing the next morning. Okay. I just so, wasn't sure if it was yeah. listed anywhere that we, how it was. That they, you know, yeah. what steps you have to take. Do we have to call the town health officer, animal control officer? <clears throat> yes, you probably know better than we do. I'm Rose Pelchuk. I want you to feel safe <coughs> in your community. <laughs> And if you have any questions, you pick up the phone and you call the town office. Done deal. That's it. They will lead you. They will guide you. We have a town website with enough policies and procedures on there. If you want to do some reading, that's <laughs> my <laughs> job. I was doing some reading. It, it, it said that so like uh, there was no animal control officer. Right now, we don't right, 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 right. have one right. in pending. When I looked pending. on the website, yeah. I was yeah. just asking. But I just want you to feel confident that this is a safe place and we all care so yeah. deeply. And I, I don't want right you to feel trouble. Um, oh, I'm or, slept or anxious. We, and, just because it. Why well, I mean, people do feel anxious? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to offer you a little bit of reassurance that we're right. all here because we care. We're all doing. I know. I, I mean, care. I've been bit by a dog. It's not like I don't take that up as a life. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, I got bit in the face by a dog. And I, I, you know, it's not. But if ever you have a question, Barbara and Tegan, they will. They will lead you. Mm -hmm. They will lead you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Rose. All right, anything else? Then I'm going to turn to the select board and ask, do you folks all feel confident that we have enough information to make a decision? Or would you rather not close the hearing just in case we feel we want to get more information? So are you saying we're not going into executive session? Are we oh, yes. Yeah. We're yeah. It's not executive session. This is a different thing. We're going into deliberative session, and we do not have to report out. So we're going to close or adjourn the hearing right now, and then we will talk about when we might go into deliberative session, which could be tonight. Okay, so that's my question. My first question is, shall we close or continue the hearing? I feel like we should have some deliberation before we make that. Before, okay, I suspected that was the case. Okay, in that case, I would take a motion to continue this hearing to a date. Uh, first of all, uh, now yeah, that's what we'll do. To continue this hearing to a date and time certain. So moved. Would you like to offer a date and time certain? Uh, should we do it during our next regular select board meeting? We've got a very full agenda on the 12th. I'm not sure that we can. Oh, we have, we're here on June 5th. Uh, it's the BCA. The BCA meetings. Authority. Yeah, but is that, is that a regular meeting? Though? That's not that a select board meeting. That's a board meeting. Is that going to take more than an hour? It depends on how much feedback we get from BCA members. And what time is that? Six. It's starting. It's scheduled for 6 to 7.30. If people come prepared, it can go very quickly. <laughs> if you don't come She's prepared, it will take longer. <laughs> it's also a little bit of a wait. Right. From now. It is. Well, what would you like to offer as part of your motion? I don't know. Okay, time certain. Um, I guess 
for lack of something better, June 26th. The next regular select board meeting. Oh, okay. You the next regular select board meeting okay. where we'll have time. All right, so we have a motion to continue the hearing. Uh, what would we say? It's 6 o'clock, so we do it first if we do it. Um, and does that leave open the possibility that we just after we deliberate, we will have made a decision? It does. And, and, and if that happens, we will simply at 6 o'clock on June 26 close the hearing. Okay. But, but we can but we issue will have a vote. Yeah. What yes. I want to know is how long people have to wait. We can. Is there a we can. Of and at that point, I'll send out something that tells people that uh, we will, we're just going to adjourn the hearing, that there's no need to come. Okay, because obviously the alternative is we just commit another night to right. this. Right, which may or may not be necessary. So we have a motion on the table you, to continue this hearing to 6 o'clock on June 26th. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? This going to work for everybody to do it this way? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. And now I would like a motion to go into deliberative session. So moved. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Do we need to? Thank you.